A little over 30,000 years ago, in a rainforest in what's now Borneo, a surgeon knelt over their patient, a child with an injured left leg. Using a sharp tool, probably made of stone, they cleanly sliced through the bones between the child's knee and ankle, expertly navigating the muscles, veins, and nerves to avoid death by blood loss or shock. And the operation was a resounding success. This is the oldest known surgical operation, and it took place tens of thousands of years earlier than many scientists had assumed we'd started performing such advanced medical procedures. And it forces us to ask an important question, one with far-reaching implications. When did practicing medicine in all of its varied complex forms become something that we actually started doing? While it's a hard question to answer, it's possible that our tendency to heal one another might have been with us for even longer than we've been human. Before the discovery of that amputation from Borneo, the next oldest examples of surgery come from around 7,000 years ago in the Neolithic period. An ancient farmer in what's now France had his left forearm removed, and skulls with holes drilled in them in a process called trepanning also emerged around this time. And for a long time, a common view among Western scientists was that the transition to settled agricultural societies in this period is what sparked the first major innovations in medicine. As Neolithic societies got larger and more complex in their social organization, they developed sophisticated medical knowledge, skills, and tools that earlier communities simply didn't have. But in 2020, when scientists exploring a cave in Borneo discovered the carefully buried remains of that ancient amputee, they argued that this might be wrong. Because the evidence from that burial pointed to an intentional, skilled operation and not an accident. For example, the bones of the lower third of the individual's leg ended in a clean cut. This cut was far too precise for the limb to have been severed in an accidental injury or an animal attack, both of which would have left more crushing fractures. There also was no sign of an infection in the bone, probably thanks to the application of medicinal plants native to the region. And this would have been quite an achievement in the tropics, where wound infection is difficult to prevent and hard to treat even today. In fact, based on the pattern of bone healing, the individual appears to have survived for between six and nine years after the operation, making it to around 20-ish. Now, the fact that ancient people were capable of such sophisticated behavior shouldn't come as too much of a surprise. The more we learn about the people who came before us, the clearer it becomes that ingenuity, resourcefulness, and compassion are all traits that have been part of us for as long as we've been human. But what about medicine? After all, from an evolutionary perspective, practicing medicine is a trait too, a complex social behavior, and an unusual one at that. So if it's older than the Neolithic period, and older even than the burial from Borneo, how much farther back can we trace it? Well, self-medication is actually pretty widespread, popping up in various diverse animal groups across the family tree. Many species have been observed seeking out and using particular medicinal plants, often to treat or ward off parasites, for example. From bears to birds to elephants to us primates, self-medication seems to be a routine and probably fairly ancient behavior in the animal kingdom. But the social aspect of medicine, not just trying to heal yourself, but actively trying to heal others, is much harder to identify outside of Homo sapiens. And even for other extinct human relatives who we know were like us in so many ways, it's not something we could easily determine if they were doing based on fossil evidence alone. But we do have evidence that other human relatives cared for individuals with injuries and illnesses, helping them to live with conditions that would have otherwise left them unable to survive by themselves. Like the male Neanderthal from Iraq called Shanadar I, for example, dating to around 40,000 years ago. He lived with a range of debilitating conditions that meant he was likely cared for by his wider community. It's a case that we dug into in our episode, The Neanderthals That Taught Us About Humanity. And I recommend that you watch it because Shanadar won. I got much respect for him. And we've also found an older hominin dating to around 1.7 million years ago who had survived years despite losing almost all of his teeth, again suggesting some level of care from his social group. And even further back in time, over 2 million years ago, we found Australopithecines, members of a genus of early hominins, that lived with skeletal injuries and illnesses. Seeing as it would have been hard for them to forage for food and water, stay safe from predators, and move from place to place, some researchers have argued that they too benefited from some level of social care. But these are all potential examples of hominins helping each other live with medical conditions, which is not the same as actively treating those conditions, aka medicine. Evidence of that has not been as easy to come by. We haven't yet found any conclusive examples of other hominins performing surgical operations, for instance. And while it's a safe bet that they were using medicinal plants and fungi from their environment to medicate themselves, we don't have any direct evidence that they used these remedies on others. For example, we found traces of medicinal plants preserved in the dental calculus of a Neanderthal with a tooth abscess. He seems to have been eating material from a poplar tree, which is known to produce a natural painkiller. 
If we were to find similar signatures of medicinal plants in the calculus of an infant or an immobile adult who probably couldn't forage for themselves, that could suggest that they were treated by others. But we haven't. <laughs> At least not yet. The fossil record can only give us so much information, and complex social behaviors are notoriously difficult to infer from it. So does that mean in our evolutionary journey, healing each other is something that we could only say for sure is as old as our species, Homo sapiens? Well, until very recently, it seemed like the answer was yes. But if the answer was yes, I would not be here. We just didn't have the hard evidence to the contrary. But in 2019, that suddenly changed. See, researchers in the rainforest of Gabon were working on a long-term project to observe a local chimpanzee community when they noticed something strange. Over the course of about 15 months, the researchers saw wounded chimps repeatedly perform a never-before-seen behavior. And when I say this is strange, I would like for you to go like this before I tell you about it, because when I first learned about this, it made my brain break in half. The chimps caught a type of small flying insect from the air, squeezed it briefly between their lips, and applied it to their open wounds, rubbing it around for a bit before throwing it away. And the researchers saw the chimps do this 19 times with what seemed like the same kind of insect, although the researchers were too far away to identify the species. Now this alone was a pretty remarkable observation. It was another possible instance of self-medication in non-human animals, and the first ever recorded that involved applying insects to a wound. But what was even more remarkable was that in a few instances, they saw individuals apply the insects to the wounds of others. Those instances included a mother applying the insects to the wound of her son, and in one case, adult chimps applying insects to the wounds of another unrelated adult. These observations, published in 2022, may represent the first recorded example of non-human animals actively treating the wounds of others. And it gives me a little bit of hope for all of us. What medicinal effects the insects might have had is still an open question. Perhaps they have some soothing anti-inflammatory or antimicrobial properties. Until we identify the species, we just don't know. But insects and other invertebrates have been used by many human societies for medicinal purposes over the years too. From leeches to slugs and snails to termites, to name a few. And what the chimps are doing seems pretty similar. While trying to find deep time evidence of healing others has eluded us so far, it seems like the present may be the key that helps us understand the evolution of medicine. After all, if chimps are medicating each other, isn't it possible that this behavior was present in our common ancestor some six to seven million years ago? Whatever the answer, this trait that was once thought to be exclusively human might actually be more widespread than we thought. And maybe even an important part of our evolutionary success story, allowing us to thrive in situations that might have otherwise been deadly, something it still does for us millions of years later. Did you know that your dental calculus is the only part of your body that fossilizes while you're alive? Find out more in our episode, The 40 Million Year Old Ecosystem in Your Mouth. Also, fun fact, dental calculus is literally harder than the calculus you learn at school. If there's a bound calculus joke, I haven't heard it. And thanks to this month's eontologists who are the best medicine. <laughs> I see no lie. Jake Hart, Raphael Hassa, Annie and Eric Higgins, John Davison Ng, Melanie Lamb Carnivale, Eddie, Tony Dye, and Juan M. Become an Eonite at patreon.com slash eons, and you can get fun perks like submitting a trivia question for me to read. Here's one from Dylan. How do you tell if a fossil is from a placental mammal or a marsupial? Put your guesses in the comments and stick around after the blooper to get the answer. And as always, thanks for joining me in the Adam Lowe studio. Subscribe at youtube.com slash eons for more happenings in the Holocene. <laughs>Did you know that your dental calculus is the only part of your body that fossilizes while you're alive? I am so hungry right now. Mm. Let me do that again. <laughs> How, am I the one who's like really grossed out by that? Ready for the answer to the trivia question? Here it is because um, the panel is stopped. Fossil marsupials have extra bones in their pelvis called epipubic bones, while true placental mammals don't. Okay, uh, that's totally news to me. I was thinking about like nursing or like uterus or pouches, but none of that stuff fossilizes. Did you get it right? Because I didn't even, I was so in the dark that I couldn't even guess. <laughs> Which is probably worse than getting it wrong.